Thanks again, John. So uh, when we think about the treatment of double hit lymphoma, and I'm going to define what that is for everybody, it's a subset of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And I think most uh, physicians have said that at least for the last 10 years, our CHOP is the standard treatment approach for advanced stage diffuse large B cell lymphoma due to both randomized trials as well as uh, experiences like this one from Vancouver, where after the introduction of rituximab, approximately 60 to 70% of patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma may be cured of their disease using RCHOP treatment. I think we know clinically that there are a number of variables that affect this. Uh, the, there's the IPI, the NCCN IPI, various clinical prognostic factors that are able to split uh, a low risk group out that has a 96% five year overall survival from the highest risk group that has a 38% overall survival using at least one of these stratifications. Despite this, most people still use RCHOP treatment to treat um, all large cell lymphoma and ha have not really modulated treatment much based upon the IPI. I think we also know that there are a number of other ways that uh, large cell lymphoma can be divided up uh, genetically. And using uh, cell of origin, uh, ABC, GCB divisions, or other gene expression profile signatures like stromal 1, stromal 2, you can similarly uh, divide patients into patients who do well and those patients who do less well. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this because this is the subject of the next debate. But let's start then with that background with a case, and this is an actual case of a 62-year-old professor who presented with a colon mass. Uh, there were no B symptoms. He felt well, but did notice some intermittent abdominal cramping that led to this workup. LDH was normal at presentation. Hemoglobin was normal. And when this mass was biopsied, it had a characteristic appearance of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Subsequently, additional evaluation was done, which suggested this was CD10 positive, uh, which would be consistent at least using an immunohistochemical algorithm of a GCB subtype of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And with early stage disease and no IPI risk factors, GCB subtype, this patient should have a very high cure rate with our CHOP treatment. Uh, in the MINT study, which was designed for patients like this, the cure rate was greater than 90% using our CHOP. However, some additional studies were done on this, and the key 67 was found to be high. A mixed stain was performed, which was positive in greater than 50% of the lymphoma cells and a BCL2 stain was performed, which was positive in greater than 90% of the lymphoma cells. And after that IHC was done, FISH was performed, which confirmed both the presence of a MYC break as well as uh, BCL2 IGH uh, translocation. And just with that additional data, no change in the presentation, the progression-free survival with RCHOP is now approximately 20%. And I think that we're now able to recognize this group of patients who doesn't do very well with our CHOP. And I think the question is, how do we approach them? So this is a real problem. So let's just establish some terminology. First of all, at the highest level, we think about three different histologic diagnoses. And this is what is rendered by the pathologist. You have a large group of patients that have this diagnosis of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. A much smaller group of patients have Burkitt lymphoma. And usually, particularly with modern definition, the distinction between Burkitt lymphoma and diffuse large B cell lymphoma is fairly clear. There is an overlap group called B cell lymphoma unclassified with features intermediate between large cell and Burkitt lymphoma. And a lot of the patients that we're talking about that are double hit patients fall into that group. Remember, MYC is really necessary to make a diagnosis of Burkitt lymphoma. The difference is, is that with Burkitt lymphoma, MYC is usually the only genetic rearrangement, whereas with double hit or triple hit or more complex diffuse large B cell lymphomas, there are several abnormalities. So at least for the purposes of this talk, 
And I know the new WHO classification is planning to formalize terminology like this. We're going to refer to double hit lymphoma as diffuse large B cell lymphoma or B cell lymphoma unclassified that has a MYC break apart, in other words, a translocation involving MYC, with either a BCL2 translocation or a BCL6 translocation, so at least two translocations. Double protein lymphoma is described as simply abnormally increased protein expression that albeit may have variable cutoffs on immunohistochemistry that may or may not have the translocation. And in fact, there are three times as many patients that have double protein lymphoma as double hit lymphoma. So the double hit is only a subset of the patients that have abnormalities when you use IHC to define them. We take a look at who these patients are with double hit lymphoma with the translocation. This was a nice uh, collection of patients that was assembled uh, and published in blood last year. And I think there's some very important points to make. The median age of these patients in this series was 60. In some of the other series, they're even higher. So this is a disease that tends to be of older patients. And that's an important fact to remember when we think about what the treatment for these patients should be. Not all of the patients, but many of them do have an increased or high, uh, a, a low performance status, I should say. And 22% of them have prior indolent lymphoma. So not infrequently, when prior follicular lymphoma transforms to large cell lymphoma, it acquires a MYC translocation. And that may be one of the reasons why in the past, transformed lymphoma had a poor prognosis. The outcome of MYC positive diffuse large B cell lymphoma with conventional therapy is quite poor. There are several studies that have demonstrated this. Uh, most of them are uh, either registry type experiences or an sub analyses of clinical trials. But no matter how you look at it, if you have a MYC in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, it does worse than if you don't. It's approximately 8 to 14 percent of these diffuse large B cell lymphomas are positive by fish for MYC. And importantly, not all of these have aggressive features. So for example, the patient that I presented didn't have a, an LDH of 2,000. He felt well. He didn't have B symptoms, and yet he had this abnormality. So if you're worried about this abnormality, you cannot use clinical criteria to define which patients you test. You have to use some other way. Part of the reason for the poor outcome is that these patients have a disproportionately high rate of CNS progression. Now, I mentioned that about three times the number of patients who have double hit have double protein. That's, again, the IHC-defined increased MYC and increased BCL2. These patients also have an inferior prognosis compared to patients who don't have this. So this is a, a one paper recently published. The double hit patients had the worst outcome. The patients that didn't have those abnormalities had an improved outcome and looks pretty much like a diffuse large B cell lymphoma curve. Patients with double protein had an intermediate outcome, but it was still uh, less favorable. And the same thing was seen in this other series. It's about a third of patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma that will be double protein. And I have to say about, because some of that is how you define double protein. Most studies have used a MYC uh, staining cutoff of 40%. The problem is if you slide that in one direction or another, the numbers change dramatically. And in fact, what our experience has been at our institution is that many of the patients are coming in right at about the 40% cutoff, which makes it of some concern to me that, that some of this is in the eye of the beholder. Interestingly and importantly, like our patient, if you have germinal center type diffuse large B cell lymphoma and a MYC abnormality, it tends to be double hit. And if you have ABC subtype, it tends to not be a double hit, meaning that there are other mechanisms that are causing the increased MYC expression. Even in the relapse setting, uh, this has a poor prognostic outcome. This was a sub-analysis of the CORAL study that just shows that the outcome is dismal 
even if the patients are able to go on and get an autologous stem cell transplant in relapse disease that is MYC positive. And in my mind, this really defines a group of patients for novel therapeutics. People have tried to look and do more sophisticated analyses. For example, um, does the translocation partner impact outcome? And you can see that there's an argument uh, that is made here that if you're um, immunoglobulin heavy chain with MYC, it's much worse than if you're non-immunoglobulin heavy chain with MYC. But both of these have very poor outcomes. And there were 55 patients in this series. Only nine of them were alive after two years. And it really just emphasizes that the outcome is essentially universally poor. And just some evidence that this is truly a different disease or a way we should think about this. In a supervised gene expression analysis that was done, there are unique genes that are expressed in patients that have MYC positive and BCL2 positive disease compared to patients who have MYC negative and BCL2 negative disease. And in fact, in this uh, consortium study, the inferior prognosis of ABC subtype of diffuse large B cell lymphoma was largely driven by the MYC positivity and BCL2 positivity in that group. In other words, if you took out the patients that were double protein positive, the ABCs did about as well as the GCBs in this study. The other thing is, if you just do a back of the envelope calculation, the majority of the failures in diffuse large B cell lymphoma in the RCHOP era are double protein positive. If you have 100 patients and 30 to 40 of them are going to fail, the majority of those 30 to 40 are patients who are double protein positive. And finally, the unique gene expression profile in this group suggests possible therapeutic targets. And finally, I, just as far as background goes, I just want to emphasize, uh, because uh, there are some vocal people that tend to, to make this point, that the mechanisms of protein expression may be different in different uh, subsets of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So in the germinal center subset of diffuse large B cell lymphoma, this was from a nice review recently published by Randy Gascoigne. The um, translocations are driving the overexpression of BCL2 and of MYC, whereas in the ABC subset, it tends to be various signaling abnormalities that result in that. I would still maintain, though, if your target of therapy is MYC or BCL2, it doesn't necessarily matter what events are leading up to those uh, pro uh, changes. So let's go back to the case that I presented at the beginning. Remember, this was the professor who I said had a progression-free survival of 20%. And I'm not going to ask for a vote, but I would say, how would you treat this patient? And I think there are a number of options. RCHOP, RCHOP with an auto, dose-adjusted REPOC, the hyper-CVAD methotrexate cytarabine regimen, codox MIVAC or a Burkitt type of regimen, or if you're in Europe, RACVBP. And I think any of those answers is probably okay. Um, I certainly have favorites, but there are no randomized studies, and I think one could defend if there were a debate any of these answers, but I'm going to show you some data that's out there to help inform at least how I think about treating a patient like this. So because the outcome with RCHOP alone is, is considered poor, a lot of groups have said, well, we need to be more aggressive with, with chemotherapy. And um, because um, Burkitt lymphoma responds to highly intensive chemotherapy, some groups have looked at that. So this is a study that had um, uh, was published several years ago in blood of a modification of the McGrath regimen, the codox m IVAC regimen for Burkitt lymphoma. And just to make the point that this was a, uh, the modification was done to allow older patients to get this regimen. And the median age in this study was still relatively young because it included both Burkitt as well as diffuse large B cell lymphoma. But in the small number of patients that were true double hit that had the 1418 translocation, they were all dead within five months of this treatment. There's no evidence in this that you were able to salvage any of the double hit histology using this aggressive regimen. And in press uh, is a study from Vancouver that looked at their experience of Codox MIVAC with or without an autologous transplant for this group of patients. This was a group of double hit lymphoma. 
but already we're starting to see some selection here. The median age was 53. It's younger than what you'd normally expect. Still, with or without the transplant, uh, less than half of, or so only 44% of these patients were in remission in two-year follow-up. And although they make the argument that transplants seem to maybe help as a consolidation, almost half of the patients didn't make it to transplant because of early progression. So I think consolidation options are not going to impact the majority of patients with this problem. I think the study that people at least have some early enthusiasm about was presented at the ASH meeting. And this is a complicated study. And honestly, we don't know how many of these patients yet are truly double hit patients. This was a study that enrolled patients with MYC positive disease. And you had to be MYC positive by fish and it was either Burkitt or large cell lymphoma. What we know is that the patients overall did quite well, and when you try to look at a subset of MYC positive patients that were BCL2 positive by stain, the curve looked like this. But they haven't gone back and fished those patients for BCL2, so we don't know how many of these patients are indeed double hit. But there's a signal here that with short follow-up, these patients seem to be doing better than historical curves with our CHOP. And although the follow-up is short, I would remind you that early progression is a problem in this disease. So getting between 12 and 24 months of follow-up on these patients may be sufficient to determine whether or not these patients are doing well. We really look forward to longer follow-up on this study as well as a further definition as to who these patients are. Last year, a subset analysis of the RCHOP versus RACVVP trial was presented that tried to explore uh, subgroups of patients who may have done better with ACVVP. This is an aggressive chemotherapy regimen used in France, and the V is Vindicine, a drug not available in the United States. But they did report in that, if you look deep in that study, 28 patients that were MYC and BCL2 positive by protein. No fish was done. And their only point was that the double protein status did not appear to have significant prognostic impact in this trial for whatever reason. Uh, they did conclude that the outcome of ABC diffuse large B cell lymphoma was better with RACVVP, and we might be hearing a little more about that in the next debate. I mentioned that collection of patients. Uh, this was the outcome of how those patients were treated, and this is kind of a show-and-tell study. It was uh, somebody who said, send, send me the patients with double hit lymphoma and let me know how you treated them, and we, we put this together. And the conclusion was that for patients who got RCHOP, the outcome was about as bad as what had been previously presented in the literature. Patients who got more aggressive regimens, whether it was dose-adjusted EPOC, Codex MIVAC, or hyper -CVAD, did appear to have better outcome. There was a trend toward improved overall survival, not just progression-free survival, although the patient numbers were probably insufficient to really determine whether that's truly the case. Um, there was no impact on overall survival with an autologous transplant. They developed a prognostic score, which I think is probably not so relevant because almost all of these patients do poorly. And I would say that the retrospective design of this certainly limits the ability to make definitive treatment recommendations, but it is hypothesis generating that a more aggressive regimen uh, helps. And MD Anderson last year published another uh, series. Uh, historically, they went back and said, how did we treat our patients with double hit lymphoma? And you can see here that uh, our EPOC seemed to win out, at least at MD Anderson, um, and seemed to have a better outcome than the hyper -CVAD. They had a lot of patients that they gave the hyper -CVAD regimen to as well. They also said in this study that, similar to previous studies, the cumulative incidence of CNS involvement was quite high, and their conclusion was that further research is needed to identify predictive or targetable biologic markers and novel therapeutic approaches for double hit uh, lymphoma patients. And I'll just conclude with a forward-looking uh, thought on some novel agents that may be relevant for these patients. There's some enthusiasm preclinically looking at um, ways to target proliferation. So uh, 
JQ1 is a small molecule inhibitor of the bromo domain and BET family of bromo domain proteins. And it's been shown to have broad anti-tumor activity across diffuse large B-cell lymphoma subtypes. And it's been shown in the laboratory to suppress C-MYC expression regardless as to whether this expression is tr due to a translocation, an amplification, or no obvious perturbation. Uh, John mentioned ABT199 in his talk uh, previously. Uh, Preclinically, this has been shown to enhance the JQ1 activity in double-hit lymphoma cells in vitro. And uh, one could envision this being a very rational combination where you're targeting both BCL2 as well as MYC in these patients. Uh, we've looked at other ways of targeting proliferation, and Aurora A kinase is induced by MYC, and there's a drug called Alicertib that targets Aurora A kinase, and in a trial that had a number of different histologies, including one patient with Burkitt lymphoma, and a couple of patients that had uh, MYC positivity by IHC, uh, there was activity in uh, these patients. This is an example of a large cell lymphoma patient that had a response to this agent. And preclinically, this agent has been combined with vincristine and rituximab, uh, particularly vincristine due to uh, its also anti-proliferative effects. And if you look at a double hit model in a murine xenograft, those patients who got the triplet combination, those uh, animals that got the triplet combination had very long survival. So just to conclude on double hit lymphoma, so we have up to 30% of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma are double protein, and the majority of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma treatment failures are in this group. 18, eight to 14% of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma are double hit by fish. These have the worst prognosis. Uh, particularly with fish, GCB is more likely to have this abnormality than non-GCB. And the challenges of treatment are that induction failure is a problem, so that limits the benefit of consolidation or salvage. Many of these patients are advanced age, which may limit the ability to give regimens like hyper-CVAD. And it is a heterogeneous disease entity, particularly the double protein, because there's differential biology between fish positive and fish negative cases. So I believe this is the greatest unmet need in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. I think we need dedicated trials in this group. I mentioned the NCI trial. This may form a baseline for this population. And the United States cooperative groups are hard at work to try to generate a clinical trial, a prospective study that will ask randomized questions in this group of patients. And clearly, based on the poor outcomes and the, the induction failure problem, this is really an optimal space for novel therapeutics like BCL2 inhibitors, bromo domain inhibitors, and aurora kinase inhibitors. So finally, I'll just say I think we are ready for a precision approach to diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, at least for double hit. And um, we'll hear later about the uh, right side of this slide as to whether there's a, a appropriate um, timing for a precision approach. But I think for double hit, my preference, uh, if I see a patient like the one I described in clinic uh, this week, I would give dose-adjusted REPOC based on small data. Um, but I think novel agents are, are really going to be the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>